you very much, everybody, for joining in. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining in on the very first session of our graduate um, seminar here at the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. We really appreciate Dr. Pavlov Sarma for joining us today to talk to us. And I'm going to, what I'll do right now is I'll just give a very quick overview our bio for Dr. Sharma. He's a co-founder and chief scientist at Takius, responsible for modeling and optimization technologies underlying the Takius platform. He's a renowned expert in closed loop reservoir management with multiple patents and papers on various topics, including simulation, optimization, data assimilation, and machine learning. He has many years of research experience in oil and gas industry, including working for the great Chevron, we just found out we overlapped with each other, very cool, and Slumberjay prior to Takius. He has received many awards, including the Informs Prize and Danzig Dissertation Award from Informs and the Miller Ram, um, Ramy Fellowship at Stanford University, Chevron's Excellence of Reservoir Management Award, and the Siam Award in ex for Excellence of Research. He holds a PhD in Petroleum Engineering, a PhD minor in Operations Research from Stanford University, and a BTEC from Indian School of Mines. He's an SBE Distinguished Lecturer and currently serves as committees in SBE Reservoir Simulation Conference, EAGE European Edge European Conference on Mathematics and Oil Recovery, and the JPT Editorial Committee. All right, Dr. Sharma, with all that, thank you so much for joining us, and please go ahead, take it away. Thank you very much, Michael. Yeah, and thanks, uh, everyone, for inviting me for this uh, talk. So yeah, as uh, Michael said, so the, the topic of my talk is uh, physics embedded machine learning for modeling and optimization of mature fields. Uh, so the idea is to combine machine learning and, and reservoir physics into a unified model to bridge the gap between two traditionally disparate modeling models, that of traditional uh, modeling and simulation and data science and machine learning. <clears throat> so before, before I begin my talk on the subject, I just wanted to briefly uh, highlight the relationship between uh, machine learning and digital transformation, which is one of the key initiatives undertaken by the oil and gas industry uh, in the last decade or so. And so this is a uh, this is a report from McKinsey, which highlights the fact that uh, digital transformation will have a significant impact on reservoir modeling, production optimization, and process automation. And this slide here is one article among many, many articles that uh, conclude that AI and machine learning are key enablers of digital transformation. So it is easy to understand why AI and machine learning has become important tools in the, in the toolkit for reservoir modeling, production optimization, and operational uh, automation. So with that, I'll, I'll start my talk as, as a lot of the focus is on, on use of machine learning for, for uh, optimization. So here's the agenda of my talk. So, I'll start by introducing closed loop optimization, which was in fact the topic of my PhD at Stanford. Uh, and then you'll see how, I mean, there's obviously a lot of different things here, but the, the basic idea is continuous model-based optimization, operational optimization of an asset. And uh, closed loop optimization is uh, related to digital transformation because it is one of the key enablers of, of uh, smart fields or, uh, uh, I mean, many companies call it by different names. Chevron used to call it smart fields. I think BP called it intelligent field and shall call it, I think, field of the future or something like that. So all these different names, but for the same kind of ideas is this continuous closed loop optimization of an asset. So there are three components to these kind of optimizations. So the first one, and probably the that is the topic of my talk today is this a fast forward model, the model that relates control variables to responses so that, that you can actually optimize those, those responses. Uh, so here I'll talk about these, these uh, uh, models that combine physics and machine learning together. And for short, I'll call this data physics model. And then of course, you also need ways to assimilate data into these models and, uh, and then also ways to efficiently optimize these, these models. And there's a lot of work obviously in the oil and gas industry. I think UT and Stanford, UT, other universities have done a lot of great work in this area. So I'll not focus on that. I'll focus on this different kind of modeling, I think, which is, I think is new to the industry, at least in the last few years. Uh, so then I'll, I'll, I'll talk about a few case studies. The first is, the water, uh, is a, a three, actually four case studies all on water flood optimization, which is optimizing injection rates and um, uh, basically convergence of producers to injectors, et cetera, uh, to optimize different objectives like uh, production, net present value, et cetera. And here I'll go through the process of how we are building these models, how we understand the models are predictive, 
and then go to defining the, the this water distribution and capacity optimization problem. And then I'll talk about these case studies where, of actual field implementations. So some of these uh, projects have been going on for three years now. So you have actual results of the uh, model building and implementation of the recommendations from the models on the real fields. So with actual results, so I'll go through uh, to those as well to see how it worked and how where it, where it did not work, et cetera. And then I'll talk about another application of the same kind of modeling, but instead of optimizing injection rates, et cetera, we're optimizing in fill drilling locations to maximize uh, the present value while minimizing drilling costs. The objective is to optimize the locations of the wells and the well count. And then finally, a summary. <clears throat> Okay, so closed loop optimization, again, there's like a lot of work in this uh, in this area for the past two decades. I think a lot of that work started at Delft University with Professor Jansen, I'm sure some of you know him. And then there, there was a lot of work again at Stanford on uh, with Ludorovsky and his students. I was one of them uh, working on this area of closed loop optimization. So the basic idea here is that you have uh, this box here presents a real reservoir. And this box here is a set of models uh, that represent your real reservoir. And in this case, in the examples I'm going to show you, these are data physics models, but this could also be traditional simulation models. It could be pure machine learning models. It could be analytical models, essentially a representation of the real field. Uh, and generally there's more than one model to quantify uncertainty, right? So, uh, and then the idea is that there is a data repository, which is receiving data and some frequency. It could be daily, monthly, hourly, depending upon the kind of problem you're solving. And then they're they're using some kind of data assimilation algorithms to uh, to to update these models to minimize uncertainty of these models. The idea is again, more data you have, usually it's uh, assimilated into the models. The better the models are in terms of uh, minimize uncertainty. So once you have updated your models with the latest data, then you are using these models with a set of optimization algorithms to optimize the operational decisions. In the example I'm going to show it, the first example is this injection rate optimization. We're trying to optimize the injection rates of all the injectors over time to maximize or minimize multiple objectives. Uh, and objectives could be, as I said, uh, maybe long-term uh, oil production, short-term oil production, net present value, injection, total capacity of injection, et cetera. So generally multi-objective optimization problem. So once you have done that and you've found an optimal uh, uh, target plan that you want to implement, you go and implement those changes in the field and you get new data from the field and then you continue this process of updating the models and of re-optimizing. As soon as you update the model, the last optimization is no longer optimal or it becomes suboptimal because the model has changed. So you have to now re-optimize and then continue this process throughout the life of the field. So that's a general idea behind closed loop optimization. And, uh, but the focus here would be on these, these models. Uh, what are these models that allow us to sort of do this quickly? Because in, in, my, in my role before in Chevron, we're kind of doing the same kind of uh, ideas, but the model was a simulation model. And the difficulty with simulation models, as I think some of you are well aware, is that it takes a long time to build these models, going all the way from the geological model to, uh, to the uh, history matched model is usually months, sometimes even years, depending upon the size of the model. And then running the models themselves can be hours to days, depending upon the size of the model which makes it very difficult to run these, these large scale optimizations because these require run, running these models thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of times to get the full rate of fund if you're doing a multi-objective optimization. So there is a need for these fast models. They may not be as accurate as, as, as a full traditional simulation model, but they are sufficiently good to do the kind of optimization that we are trying to do, right? So kind of getting the, the appropriate appropriately complex model that is good enough to do the optimizations, uh, the kind of optimizations that we're doing. Again, these models may not be appropriate for all kinds of problems. And what we have seen is it will require obviously a significant amount of data to build these models because they are data first models. And as a result, they are very well suited for mature fields, but they may not be well suited for say green fields where there's not enough data. That's where say traditional simulation models would be the right thing to do as opposed to these kind of models. Okay, so before I talk about like again going into this particular topic, so I'll just like to highlight the difference between say traditional modeling and machine learning and then sort of uh, talk about how, I, how we put this together. So in traditional modeling, what you're given is say some input data of X, for instance, injection rates, 
and then some equations or some rules that relate this, this uh, input data X to some output Y, let's say oil production, right? So it is a, this is what's a, it's a first principles modeling where you know the, the relationship between your input and the output. And so basically you code that up and then basically you have your model. And this is it. And you, like a, for instance, a traditional simulation model. In, in machine learning, you are, you're kind of doing the opposite. So basically you're given some historical observed input, say again, injection rates, observed injection rates, and also observed output, in this case, observed oil, oil rates. And the idea is to find the relationship between my uh, input and output by, for example, minim by, uh, uh, and this is a functional relationship. So we are trying to find this from the optimal functional relationship from say a set of possible functions F and capital F here, which could be say neural network support vector machines, all kinds of models that basically such that when you apply, when you apply these, uh, that function on your historical input, then the, the calculated output is as close to the observed output as possible, right? So that's the general idea behind machine learning. So trying to, instead of, so here you're given the historical data, you're trying to find the relationship between the input and the output. So there again, there's the many benefits of both approaches. Traditional modeling, you're able to ingest all kinds of data, even conceptual data, for example, the conceptual geological models, et cetera, can be ingested into these models. Uh, uh, so, they, so they are very flexible and then they're very general. But the issue is, again, it takes a lot of time and effort to build these models and sometimes making it difficult to apply this in this closed loop fast modeling uh, and operational optimization paradigms. On the other hand, machine learning, traditional machine learning is, is extremely fast. You can build the models very quickly. Uh, you can run these models extremely fast, but then because they don't have any uh, physical uh, information about the relationship, sometimes you can get particularly with, uh, with noisy data and data that is not very good quality, you can get models that are completely non-physical and give you, uh, uh, give you results that don't, don't make sense at all, right? And therefore, while these models may be good at predicting short-term behavior, but generally they are not good at predicting long-term behavior. So the idea is then how can I combine the best of both worlds? Like can I build models that kind of benefit from, from, the, uh, from both approaches? And that's exactly what we're trying to do in this data physics models. So this is essentially the same equation as before you see the, the equation we're trying to minimize the, the difference between the observed data and the data. Uh, and, the, and the calculated data from, from the application of my functional uh, form uh, F on my uh, observed inputs. So this is basically the usual machine learning term. So what we're doing here is also saying that, hey, instead of just finding F that basically gives me the best match to my historical data, can I also find F that also minimizes my mismatch to the, the underlying known physics of my system? So G here is basically all my governing physical equations, in this case, the mass balance equations, Darcy's law, PVT models, et cetera, all the equations that, go, uh, that define fluid flow. So basically what I'm trying to do is find F that not only matches my historical uh, observed data, but also the, the known physics. And lambda D and lambda P are the weights of these two terms. So if you, for example, if lambda P is zero, then basically this goes back to traditional machine learning because you're trying to just find a model that matches your historical data. But if lambda D is zero, then basically this becomes very similar to traditional simulation because then the best functional form that, that represents Z is of course Z, G itself, as long as you can solve it. So basically then you are trying to find this, in this case, a model that basically not only matches your data, but also your physics. And the weight of these terms depends on the noise in the data, right? So if you have very good quality data, then lambda D will be big and lambda P can be smaller uh, and, and vice versa. So that, that's where this, this idea is coming from by combining machine learning and physics together into unified models, you can kind of get the best of both, both worlds. Models that are, have longer term predictive capacity because you are con constraining this phys models to physics. At the same time, you can build them mo these models very fast and also you can run them very fast because they are ultimately machine learning models. So that's, that's a general idea of, of what we're trying to do. That there has been, I think, significant work in the recent years around this topic. And even in the oil and gas industry, I think there is work ongoing in many universities in this, in this area. Okay, so in terms of actual workflow, how does it work? So the first step is what's called the usual like training of a model, like right? uh, building a model, it's also, we also call it fitting, where you're basically again taking the historical data, the governing equations of uh, fluid flow and the machine learning models together in, and creating this unified data physics model. And then one of the one of the first steps is obviously to validate that it's a good model or not. 
And that process, I mean, there are many ways to do it. One of the usual things to do is what's called a blind test or a back test, where you basically use a portion of the data to build the model or train it, and then using the rest of the data to sort of predict. And then by comparing the predictions to the to the actual data for that for that period, you can then understand if it's a, it's a predictive model or not. Then there are also other traditional reservoir engineering uh, uh, analysis that you can do with these kind of models to understand if it's a good model or not. So once you have done, gone through the validation process, and this process of building the model, I think, as I said earlier, it usually takes about a month. And once you have done that, then you go to the optimization problem, where now you're basically fixing the model or the you have learned all that is to learn. Now you're changing the control variables or the, or the optimization variables to find the optimal creator front of all the objectives that you're interested in. And this is usually done to, uh, that what we're using for the for the training part is basically a variant of the ensemble common filter. Uh, and then for the optimization, you're using evolutionary methods uh, because the model is fast enough that we don't really need uh, uh, gradient-based uh, methods, which are generally more complex to implement and also generally not very well suited for multi-objective optimization problems. So here again, by using cloud scalable platforms and by using uh, evolutionary methods, we're able to come up with this period of front for even the largest models we have done in a matter of a few hours. <clears throat> so anyway, so that's kind of the overall process of how, how this works. So the optimization itself, as I said, is a multi-objective optimization that we are trying to solve because in general, when you're going in and working in with real problems, usually people are interested not only in one objective, but multiple objectives. I mean, almost always, it's not only, oh, I want to maximize my oil production, but they also want to, for example, cut costs, particularly in the last few years when oil price has been obviously a, a big issue, people have been very cost con conscious and they really want to always find uh, optimal scenarios that are basically not only not only increase production but also help cut costs, right? But then there could be obviously many other objectives, right? Nowadays there is a very big emphasis on say greenhouse gases and and, and carbon intensity. So you could, for example, also add a carbon intensity optimal objective. Not only find say an operational scenario that maximizes production but minimizes say carbon intensity as well. So I mean it depends on how you set up these problems, but in general, for, for, for realistic problems, you are solving multi-objective optimization problems. So here I'm showing you two exact two objectives. One say is again the cost or say injection rate, basically, uh, injection capacity, and the other is say uh, NPV or the present value or revenue. So zero zero is basically the base case or the do-nothing case. We are basically continuing operating your field as is. And here, for example, if you go on the sorry. On the y-axis, you can basically say on all these basically these dots here are, are pretty to optimal. This green and, and, and blue dots are pretty to optimal scenarios. In this case, injection rates, optimal injection rates for each injector. The gray dots are non-optimal scenarios, right? So the idea is that here, if, for example, if we chose this, this point here, the green point here, then it's a, it's an operational scenario that basically increases your revenue by 20% over the base case while keeping the same amount of injection. Or you could choose this blue uh, scenario here, which cuts injection by 40% almost while keeping the same amount of revenue. Uh, or, or as an operator, you could choose something in between where basically is, the, for example, this uh, light uh, green uh, bluish dot here, which basically is increasing revenue by 10% and cutting costs by about 20% compared to the base plan. So again, you can look at multiple different uh, objectives to come up with the optimal plan that you want to implement. So that's kind of a high level, uh, idea of what we are trying to do here at, at Takis. So anyway, so that's kind of the 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 that's a, the, the first part. The second part now is is uh, this case study. So the first case studies will be about water flood optimization. The first one is is a complex onshore field from uh, from Argentina, and we just presented this work together uh, at the Adipec. Uh, uh, so yeah, there's SP paper. I forgot to put the name here, but if you guys are interested, then I can share that later on. Uh, so it's a field that's been operation for over 20 years. It's, it's a complex fluvial environment, over 80 reservoirs. And the operator couldn't build a simulation model here because of the complexity. And so they thought this was a really good, I think, test of technology like this, because we don't require a geological model to sort of start, start building these models, right? So they thought it would be a good, good sort of test of our technology. And the objective was to model and optimize a, a portion of the field. This is a pretty big field with uh, about 100,000 100, barrels of production and over 1,000 wells or so. But for the purpose of this case study, we were, we were given about 130 total wells. And if you look at all the completions, there are about 400 plus producer completions and 120 plus injector completions because it's a multi-layered reservoir in different layers. And again, the, 
oil production for this particular uh, block was about 4,000 barrels. Injection was about 70,000 barrels. And we took about 15 years of the last data and used nine years to train the model and then six years to do the back test. And the data we're using are usual data like production rates, injection rates, pressures, completions and trajectories of the wells, et cetera, that usually go in a traditional simulation model. <clears throat> so here is the process of back test. So basically what I'm showing you on the, on the left is basically the field-wide oil production rate. And on the right, I have field-wide gross production rate, which is oil plus water. And this is the total 15 years of uh, production. And the red part is the training part and the blue part is the prediction part. The black circles are the, are the actual field-wide field or block-wise production, this blocks production basically. And the, and the red circles are basically the ensemble of models that, that we are training. So you can see it's a sequential, uh, uh, the common filter is a sequential uh, modeling approach. So you basically see here that initially the models do not match the data, all of the, all the results are all over the place. But then as you start training the model, as you assimilate more and more data, they start converging to the two data. And at some point it converges uh, until it cannot converge anymore because of the noise in the data and the approximation of the model, et cetera. And then these blue lines are the predictions from these models. And you can see that the dark blue line, which is the mean of the ensemble, is very close to the actual production from the field, right? So in the beginning, but towards the end, it starts to diverge, but the two data, the black dots are still within the range of uncertainty predicted by the models. The interesting uh, thing here is that you can see there's a light gray line that is a active well count. So what that basically means, you can see that the active well count is increasing over time. That basically means that there are a lot of new wells that are being drilled. For example, there are a lot of wells that were drilled during this blue or prediction part that were not even present during the training part, right? So that basically means you're also predicting the behavior of these new wells that had no historical data. And that's something that's usually difficult to do with pure machine learning models. And this is where the physics comes in. By embedding physics into, the, into these models, we're able to predict the behavior of this, these new wells that did not have any historical data at all. Uh, and that's one, I think, one of the key benefits of a model like this. And you can see the same kind of uh, quality of, of the predictions for gross production as well. And this is again, field level prediction. So, but uh, you obviously, obviously want to look at oil well level predictions as well, because you're going to make changes at the well level. So you want the model to be accurate at the well level as well. And here is this basically a scatter plot of, of production, cumulative production for each producer completion in this case, uh, for this prediction part, for the six years of prediction where each dot is basically one of the producer completions. On the y-axis, I have the true production. On the x-axis, I have the, the calculation mean of the ensemble. And you can see that most of the most of the wells are very close to the green line, which is a basically a perfect prediction. But of course, there is some scatter, as I said, again, we are not able to predict everything perfectly, but you can summarize the, the quality of the predictions through the usual statistical measures like Pearson and rank correlations. In this case, you can see that the rank correlation and Pearson correlation for oil is about 0.7 which is uh, in our experience good enough to, to use this model for optimization. Again, for water, it is not as good. Uh, and also for gas in general, because the quality of the measurements for water is usually not, and gas is usually not as good as oil. And therefore in, in general, you'll get better. I mean, we usually get better predictions for oil as compared to water. <clears throat> so then, as I said, there are also other ways to validate these models. And because these models embed the physical equations of fluid flows, you also have the same kind of properties, uh, uncertain reservoir properties like porosity, permeability, et cetera, as a part of these models, which are uncertain. And you're also trying to learn this, uh, the, 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 the properties as well during this training. And so what you see here on the, on the top uh, left figure is, is a, a prior and posterior distribution of permeability. So in, in the beginning, when we didn't know much at all, so we gave it a big range, almost going from say one milli RC to 3000 milli RC, uh, which is the red histogram. And then as the ensemble converges, you can see it converges to about 1800 milli RC, that is the blue hist uh, posterior uh, histogram. And so this is another way to validate. You can take this to say the geologist or the petrophysicist and confirm if these values are within range of their expectations or not. If not, maybe something is wrong with the model or maybe something is wrong with our understanding. So you can go back and do that iteration and, um, and then understand what's going on. Then you can also look at reservoir pressures because these are, again, the, the, the PDs of fluid flow are part of the model. So you can actually predict reservoir pressure as well. And then you can compare, say, to say build up test uh, uh, and, and, and reservoir pressure predictions from the models and look at trends, et cetera, to understand if it is predictive or not. You can look at things like connectivity for, for between injectors and producers to understand if, again, this makes sense or not. All these things can be uh, created from these models uh, once you have trained the model. 
So, uh, so once you've done that and you validated the model, then the next step is this optimization. In this case, the, the, the operator was uh, uh, interested in two objectives. One is 15 year net present value and the other is injection capacity. So they, they are basically injecting, as I said, about, I think 65,000 barrels at that time, uh, which is this blue triangle is the, uh, is the base case. So injecting about 65,000 barrels on an average and the uh, net, net 15 year predicted net present value for the base case is about $200 million. And this is the Pareto fund, the red and the green dots. And you can see that uh, basically uh, uh, what the operator decided to do after looking at this Pareto fund was to choose this plan, which basically is almost the same amount of injection. It's a little bit more injection, but it increases uh, our NPV by about 8%. So that, that uh, red, uh, sorry, red square, is basically the target plan that the, that the operator was interested in implementing. But then uh, while the optimization has a lot of the constraints, the operational constraints, but not everything can be imp uh, implemented in this in this optimizations. And always there's something that might be missing or something that changes. So the operator couldn't actually implement exactly the recommended injection plan, but they could implement about 85% of the plan. So it, and it took about them about two months. So this project started around uh, October, September of 2018. It took us about four months at that time to sort of go through the data uh, ingestion and building the model, validating the model. Uh, this is because it's one of our first models at that time. And then it took them about two months to actually take that injection plan and then implement that plan. And they implemented about 85% of the plan. So we took their actual implemented plan and ran it through the model. And then that, that gave an increased, expected increase in net present value by about 5%. So this is what expected from the actual implemented plan. Again, this is not reality yet. This is just a prediction for the model yet because this is what was done in around uh, February, March of 2019. So then what actually happened? And uh, to what is actually done? So if you remember, I said, this is a field that has about 80 layers, right? So what, what, what of course, the, we cannot, um, in this case, the data doesn't have enough resolution at the, at the level. So what they do is they basically are grouping these 80 layers into about eight layers, which are like bigger zones or, or whatever you might call it, or maybe, and, and these layers are generally also related to this injection mandrels. There are about eight to 12 mandrels in each in the injector. So these layers are kind of related to this uh, to these uh, mandrels. So the optimization was done at this layer level. And then later on, once this is done, then this is mapped back to the actual in injection mandrels. And so these layers, as you can see, each dot here, each, each square here is one of the layer, eight layers. You can see the layer names here. And each circle here is the injector completion in that layer. The green circles are the recommended object, uh, the recommendation is to increase injection compared to the base case. And the red circle is where you're cutting injection compared to the base case. The size of the circle is how by how much you're cutting. So bigger the size, more you're cutting or more you're increasing injection over the base case. So as you can see here, the first thing is obviously it's a complex plan uh, because there are there's a lot of changes across almost every injector that is changed. And this is obviously just cumulatives, but it is actually changing over time. So every time step, the injection rates may be different. So it's a very complex optimization. It's very difficult for a human brain to sort of understand and come up with something like this by using, say, manual approaches, right? So that's why you need these kind of complex optimizations to come up with these, these complex uh, uh, plans. But at the high level, you can see some certain things. For instance, you will see that in layer D and layer IJ, you can clearly see that a lot of the, there are more wells or injectors where you're increasing injection and, and less wells you're cutting injection. Whereas in other layers like layer H, you're clearly cutting injection in almost every layer. Uh, so basically what's happening if you look at the high level is that you're pushing water from some of these layers like layer H, you're taking water from these layers and pushing more water into layer D and layer IG overall. And so basically what you're doing, you're not only doing a horizontal redistribution of water, but you're also doing a vertical redistribution of water in order to achieve that 5% increase in that present value that is expected, right? So again, it's a complex optimization that requires this kind of optimization tools to, to find these optimal plans. So, but actually what happened in reality? So, so as I said, the projects are this, this green line is this, the daily oil production from this, this block. And basically you can see here, uh, sorry, this is actually meter cubes, so meter cube per day, not barrel per day. Uh, and anyway, so, 
What you see here is this is about, as I said, about October, September, October of 2018, when they basically, when the project decision was made to test this technology. So basically they stopped all external activities like drilling, et cetera, to make sure that they can get a good base decline. And you can clearly see that there's a very nice, almost exponential decline here uh, for this period from, from uh, September to, I think, March when the implementation started, right? So you can see clearly a very nice exponential decline. This is where the, the that, dashed uh, vertical line is where the first implementation of injection changes was done. And it's a very highly incompressible system. So you can immediately see a change in decline, right? Almost a flattening of decline almost immediately. And then there's, again, the decline resumes. And this happens because, because of some operational issues, some of the injectors were shut down. And when those injectors are bought back again, you can clearly see it's still flat. The, the uh, decline remains flat. And then again, a second uh, uh, model update and optimization was done around January 2020. And then you can see clearly again that the, that the, uh, the decline remains pretty much flat throughout. Right? So it has continued like this. Again, we have additional data here that basically continues like this for a long time. And so there's a third implementation that was done recently also in this, in this particular block. And now the project is extended into other blocks, three other blocks in the field. <clears throat> So the interesting thing is actually you can see the cumulative increase in production over this period is actually 15%, which is more than what was expected. If you remember, the expected increase was about 5%. So we're actually over, I mean, the, the performance was actually better than predicted. I mean, which is not, not again, good or bad, bad, but basically it is within the range of uncertainty. So if you look at the range of uncertainty from the models, this is within the range of uncertainty, but it was over, predict I mean, the result was better than what was expected. That was the first example. The other examples I'll go very quickly. So this is another example where the, the, the that was interesting. This is a very interesting example because this is actually what happened was, this is a field again in, in Argentina where they were in there, they're injecting fresh water, which is very, and it, it, it's very co it's costly to inject because they have to feed this water uh, before injecting. Uh, and what happened also during, and because of that, when COVID struck and, and basically oil prices crashed, so they really shut down a lot of the injection. They cut injection by almost 40% because it was just too expensive to inject at that time. And after you can see clearly production also declined almost immediately because there's again, this is a very mature, uh, low incompressibility water floods. So then they asked us basically then again, take this new injection rate level uh, and then basically optimize the field to see if we can stabilize production or increase production. And you can clearly see that after optimization with the changes in injection, while keeping the same reduced injection, we're able to actually increase production again. Uh, again, so that's, I said, it's one of the I think, most powerful examples of opt optimally making changes other than ad hoc changes without understanding what's going on. So this is another example where we're basically reactivating injectors. Again, this is a field where they're about the, the idea of the operator wanted to reactivate 12 injectors, which were sucked in for several years. Uh, so what they did was, we just, I mean, they had an idea about what to do, how to, uh, how to the initial program of what to change, but they didn't know what the injection rate should be or which order, what should the order be of the wells to, to reactivate. So again, we can use the same technology now, makes this is the different optimization problems. We basically now start, it's a, I mean, we can do it either as a combinator optimization problem or as a, even as a single reactivation, well by well reactivation which is much simpler to do that, although it may be a little suboptimal, but then what we, that was what was done. And we came up with the actual optimal injection rates of the injectors, and then the optimal schedule of which one to, uh, to uh, improve first, and then comparing there what they had in plan versus the, the, the optimal one, you can see a production is expected was 6% to 16%, and then increased from 9% to 22%. And finally, this is another, it's a producer to injector conversion, where basically, you are the, again, the operator has a plan to convert seven wells across the field uh, from producers to inject injectors, and they expected the production increase to be over 9%. So instead of that, so we, we took our models and basically did the combinatorial optimization and to come up with which wells to convert and in what, scale, what order and how many. And that basically, uh, uh, the recommended plan was 10 wells to convert that would lead to 21% compared to the 9% as uh, from the seven wells that were converted. So again, all these different uh, applications of the same kind of technology. <laughs> so that again, so that was kind of all similar uh, applications. So this is a, a significantly different application because this is now requires finding, up, uh, finding locations of new wells uh, to drill and the number of new wells to drill to maximize net present value.
uh, while minimizing drilling costs. So again, it's another, this is another mature water flood. It has about 225 producers and 101 injectors. It's also there are a lot of wells, but this is, it doesn't have a lot of production, about only 2,500 barrels of uh, oil and 36,000 barrels of water injection. Same kind of ideas, we use the same amount, same kind of data to build the model, same kind of back test to find that, okay, we have a valid model. And once you do that, then the, the, the optimization problem is now different. The optimization problem now has number of wells and net present value as the two objectives. And since the discrete optimization problem, you can see, of course, there are like these, the Pareto front is like this discrete Pareto front. Uh, and here, just to clarify, each blue uh, dot, dot here is a non-optimal uh, scenario, a non-optimal uh, uh, um, drilling plan, whereas this green dot is the optimal drilling plan. So if you look at, the, for example, the six wells, the green dot is the optimal locations of six wells that you can drill that's going to maximize your net present value. And the purple dots are basically non-optimal locations of six wells. So what you can see here is the interesting is obviously that as you as you add more and more wells, you obviously NPV is going up uh, as you add more and more wells to drill. But at some point at about 11 wells or 10 wells, basically the NPV flattens out, which means that the, the additional well that you're drilling, the, uh, even the optimal well that you can drill costs more than the incremental production that you're going to get from that, increment, that additional well. So that clearly tells you that there are about 11 wells that you can drill in this field. So that's the optimal number of wells to drill. So the operator was actually planning to build 30 wells, which basically then basically saved them, saved them almost like 20 wells. Uh, that would be otherwise NPV suboptimal. And this is something, again, it's, it's, I think extremely powerful from things, technologies like this, because in generally these kind of uh, problems, you can obviously solve with traditional means, but it's hard to quantify uh, the incremental oil production from new wells. Uh, so that's kind of something you can easily do with these kind of models as well. And so and here is an example, the location of those 10 optimal wells. And this was validated to, by the operator. This was very much in line with what they had in plan. Some of the best wells they were planning to do were actually very close to, to this, this plan. Uh, and it was expected that these wells will increase uh, production by about 25% and NPV by 17%. And on an average, the new wells produce about 50 barrels a day, which is close to the historically best wells in this field. Uh, so that's kind of the, uh, I think, all I had today. Uh, so again, to summarize, so what we're trying to do is combine physics and machine learning to come up with this new modeling paradigm that tries to bridge the gap between traditional modeling and data science. Traditionally, these approaches have been different, like you have traditional modelers which are, and, and domain experts who are doing machine learning. So we're doing the traditional simulation and then you have these data analytics teams who are doing machine learning. So the idea is, can you bridge the gap between them not uh, to come up with this model that, that kind of benefit from both worlds. And what we have, I mean, these models are orders of magnitude faster compared to simulation models, allowing for this large, large scale quantitative optimization. And we have applied it now to many different problems from water floods. Uh, and I showed the examples of water floods but we've also applied these to steam floods, to fracking optimization, as I said, infill drilling optimization, and even problems of back allocation, because one of the difficulties in these kind of layer reservoirs is figuring out how much is produced from where when you're combing the production. So you can use these kind of technologies also to do the back allocation process. Again, but again, like any other method, these methods also have limitations. They can, for example, only be applied when there's a significant amount of good quality data available. And therefore, they're generally applicable to mature fields, not to green fields or new fields, uh, uh, at least in our, in our experience so far. Uh, thanks a lot for your time, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Sharma. We appreciate your talk and you taking the time to speak to our students. What we'd like to do first is to open up the floor to our graduate students to ask questions. I'll give full credit. Jack, you have the first question of the semester. If you'd like to go ahead and ask your question. Hello, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. All yes. right. So, hi, Dr. Sharma. I have a quite quick question, which I have in the in the chat, and it's at the beginning of the of your slide, uh, <laughs> where uh, how uh, and uh, my question is, how do you compute the difference uh, between a uh, support vector machine and the Darcy's law when you want to uh, besides your machine learning model, you want to have some physical constraints. How do you uh, compute that? Uh, so in our work, we're using new, uh, neural networks. And uh, as you saw, I think it's basically uh, you're changing the objective function, right? So 
when you are training a machine learning model, the objective function that you're trying to minimize is the data mismatch. But instead of that, you basically are also saying that now, okay, I'm given this equations that define my, my fluid flow. And then you could, there are many different ways to sort of inject these equations and also minimize an objective function that minimizes the, 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 the difference between this, the, the, these PDEs and, and these, uh, the, the neural network. One would be a kind of a collocation-based approach where you're basically a set of points uh, which, at which you are solving these equations and then basically finding, okay, I want, at these points, I want to make sure that my neural network matches my, my, my PDEs, right? And there, there are other ways to do that as well, but that is one of the more well-known approaches that has become, I think, reasonably popular in, in the oil and gas industry recently. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Jack, for that question. I see Julian Salazar, you'd like to ask a question? Uh, yes, uh, hello, Dr. Sarma. Uh, I have one question. So uh, first, I thank you for the, the talk. It was pretty nice, amazing. And uh, so my question is, what is your approach to combining different data modalities? For example, time series, structured data, unstructured data. Do you have kind of a approach that you follow all the time or it's a kind of independent, depends of the problem you're trying to solve at the moment? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, so far we have basically dealt with structured data. So the data that goes into our models is very similar to simulation models. So we are not adding any unstructured data into our models as such. So in, in that case, I mean, it is, it is, I think, straightforward to sort of ingest this, uh, uh, the, the physical equations that this. Yeah, I'm not sure how these approaches can be extended, but uh, to add unstructured data as well. But I would assume, again, it should be also straightforward because, I mean, all you are doing, as you can see again, is that adding an additional term here that basically has nothing to do with how you are training to the traditional data, right? And this data could be structured or unstructured, doesn't really matter. And this is a completely different term that you're adding, which has nothing to do with this first term really in that sense. So you could, I think, traditionally extend the same approaches to add unstructured data as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julian. If we can take a pause, some questions. Tracy, you have an announcement for our graduate students. Tracy, would you like to make that announcement? I'll let you do it. Um, it just an announcement to make sure that the graduate students watch their email. We're going to be sending out um, graduate and faculty members also. We'll be sending out an email about the SPE local contest, the paper contest that it will be being held virtually this year. And um, there will be an email going out later today. That was okay. all my announcement. Sorry. Tracy, thank you very much. I put you on the spot, but that was a great announcement. Any other questions from graduate students in the department? Ismail? Yes, um, I do have uh, a couple of questions. The first one, um, you, you mentioned that the, that the reservoir in Argentina is, is very uh, incompressible. And I was wondering, um, was there um, free gas in the, in the reservoir or was it only two-phase flow? And yeah, there was no free gas in the reservoir in, in this case. However, we have applied these models to other fields where there is free gas in the reservoir. And the physics we're solving for is, is, is the full physics of black oil models. So this is not like, for example, say CRM models, for instance, where there is, uh, you have to make assumptions about slight compressibility or incompressibility because they are semi-analytical methods. These are not semi-analytical methods. They are numerical methods. So you can add whatever physics is, is, is uh, appropriate for a given field. And can you comment on the applications where there was free gas? How how, um, how accurate or how predictable the, the results were in your experience? Uh, the results are similar quality. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have one of them, but what you do see is obviously the, the compressibility effects. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the behavior of the predictions are, are different and particularly behave if, if say, production or uh, 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 pressure falls below bubble point, uh, those are discontinuities, which obviously, again, if you have embedded them in the equations and you can model them. Uh, but yeah, the predictions are of generally of similar quality, at least for oil production. Now, gas production, whether it is, whether it is, uh, whether there is a free gas in the reservoir or not, is generally more difficult because first of all, the quality of the measurements are extremely poor, mostly for gas. So generally the prediction quality of gas is, is not that good, but oil production is generally 
generally good enough for almost all the models that we have built so far. Got it. Uh, the other question I had was um, on slide 13, when you showed the, the uh, cross correlation. Yeah. Yeah, so here, when I look at this figure, the, the error between the true and the calculated can be very, very large. You know, sometimes it's uh, three or four orders of magnitude. Um, Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I mean, these, again, these are not perfect models by any means. But again, I think the idea is to get a good enough model that is good enough for optimization for which you don't need the model to be predictive for every well. So that, I mean, that's the basic premise here. That seems to have worked because again, we have obviously implemented these real fields with good results, but yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, some, some wells you can see are like, yeah, almost like orders of magnitude wrong uh, compared to what is true. And also remember though, it's like, there's a lot of allocation error in the actual data as well. I mean, in this case, we maybe are saying, okay, the error is maybe 20, 30% in general, but some wells error, if they're particularly smaller uh, wells, the, the, the error could be very, very large uh, because of back allocation. And, and, and is it also um, related to, when you go to the previous slide, the error at the very beginning for oil rate was very high. And does, does this also go into the calculation for the cumulative uh, oil? Which, what do you mean? I mean, beginning, you mean here in? in... Yeah, so at, in January uh, 04. Oh, no, the, no. The... So this is only for the prediction part here, the prediction yeah. part here. Yeah, so the, yeah, if this is training part. So yeah, we do, there's no point in trying to predict the training part. I mean, we're predicting the unknown data basically to the model. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, let's go ahead and start opening this up to everyone, including faculty. We have Dr. Foster up first. Hey, thank you. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. We can hear you, Dr. Foster. Okay. Um, yeah, nice talk. I just probably have a few more questions to follow up on the first questions. It, it sounds like, you know, for your, uh, are you using like a physics informed neural network for your estimator uh, in that second term in your optimization, the F minus G term? Yeah, so actually you're using a different approach. It's not exactly the physics info neural network that I think has recently become popular. So we are actually uh, constraining, so we are treating the, the physical equations as constraints rather than as a part of the objective function. So that has many benefits, including our ability to exactly match the physics if you want to. <clears throat> okay, so, so you have like Lagrange multipliers there, you're, you're enforcing them exactly or you're just penalizing? We are, I mean, so yeah, so we are enforcing the, the PDs exactly, uh, but again, the common filter changes the state of the system, right? So then the, the although the, for example, you're, when you are doing the, we're, we're solving for the physics, you, although you solve, solve exactly, but then once you update the model in the next time step, you're changing the, the, the state of the system. So in, in a way, yes and no. So the, yeah, the physics is, the equations directly are honored, but then the state of the system is changed by the filter. When you're predicting going forward, the physics is exactly honored in our system because I said it's a constraint. Okay, the, the next question is, you know, in, in, in my, I'm doing some of this work in my group as well, and like particularly with physics and formula neural networks or, you know, constrained optimization using physics. But you always have to retrain when you, when you change the boundary conditions in any way. So that like the fact that you were able to match the future production, even when you were adding new wells, is a little bit perplexing to me. Um, can you can you maybe elaborate on why that was happening? Um, yeah, again, the, I, that's those are that's one of the reasons I guess we are enforcing the the physics exactly, uh, and we also honor mass balance exactly. Unlike like the if you look at the physics and form neural networks, the way they are designed, the collocation based methods, uh, they are not uh, fully mass conserving. So what we do are variations of that that allows us to fully conserve mass. And I think that may be one of the reasons why these are performing well. It could also be because we are working with these fields with enough data. I mean, it's a question also of how much data is available, how much is not. So I think there could be many reasons why, but so far we have seen good results for, for many fields. Now we have applied this to over 20 real fields now with good results in almost every field. Yeah, that's that's one thing I was wondering is, is perhaps it just in your training phase, you're also adding wells and maybe the it's just picking up that that trend of, of adding wells during during the training phase. Oh uh, yeah, the, you can see there's during the training phase as well production. Yeah, there are wells that are coming online, but yeah, so it is it is not like all the wells were for there from day zero. Obviously, wells are always coming in online, and which is what happens in reality. But yeah, late, later on there are even more wells coming online in this case. So yeah, I mean that that could be it. It's 
it's hard to explain without knowing exactly what you guys are doing and what we are doing that's different. But our, our approach, as I understand, is fundamentally different from the pins that have become popular these uh, in, the, in the last yeah. few years. Well, my personal opinion is that pins are oversold. I mean, often the case that it takes longer to train the pin uh, to a lower yeah. level of accuracy than just the forward model. We can just solve it with a reservoir simulator faster than, than training. Right? So, <laughs> yeah, uh, anyway. that's my opinion too, so I didn't want to say that. <laughs> so, yeah, no, no. Well, I mean, our approach yeah. is, is, is different from that to some extent. Uh, unfortunately, I can't go into all the detail because a lot of it is proprietary for us. <laughs> okay. Given that that's what we like do as a company, that's our bread and butter. But yeah, so but you are you are absolutely right. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Foster. Any other questions, students or faculty? All right, Julian, I see your hand up again. Yes, uh, what, just one quick question, uh, Dr. Sarma. Why is why do you prefer genetic algorithms for optimization? Uh, ah, so. Yeah, so for us, as I said, I think we are solving the multi-objective optimization problem. And genetic, I mean, one of the big benefits is that, of course, you don't need any additional information from your forward model other than just the outputs, right? And the inputs it makes it very easy to make them general. So you can change them very easily for new objectives, new constraints, uh, and new control variables. Whereas if you're using gradient-based methods, you require the gradient information, which is generally difficult to get. And also the of course, if you have discrete problems, then you don't have a gradient. So it becomes difficult to sort of do that. So with genetic or, or rather evolutionary methods, they are general enough that you can basically easily sort of change them to a, for a given problem. And because our model is, our forward model is fast enough and we have scalability on the cloud. So it is not critical to have the most efficient optimization algorithm. So we can sort of, yeah, have, I mean, have have the optimization algorithm not be the most efficient one, but still good enough to solve the problem in a practical amount of time, which is what really matters. If you can solve the optimization problem in a half a day, that is all it need is needed to sort of use these techniques. Awesome. Thank you. I'm going to ask a question. Dr. Sarma, I, I, I appreciate the methodology, the workflow, your explanation. One thing we find in our business is that in order to trust the model, you need to be able to understand the model, diagnose the model, when it goes wrong, when it's working, when are you extrapolation, extrapolating? Is there any diagnostics with this by which you can check the specific predictions of the model? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. Yeah, so I mean, that's one of the most biggest difficulties we have had so far, I think, in terms of like getting acceptance of these kind of technology, that right? it's not only, I mean, so we are, so yeah, it's not only new modeling technology, it's also putting everything together, optimization, data assimilation, which is something that's not even there today, even a traditional modeling, with, except for maybe the big companies like Chevron or Shell or whatever. A lot of the companies don't do this kind of stuff yet. So it's difficult to sort of explain this. But yeah, over time, what we have seen is again, putting things in the perspective of reservoir engineers. And again, under, making sure that they understand there is full mass balance, being able to show that there is full mass balance helps a lot, I think, in this, in this, in this cases. And particularly things like connectivity, as I was showing, I think things like this, when people start seeing things like this, that as output from the model, and then, then I think a lot of the time, and they are able to then understand based on their reservoir, understand, reservoir understanding, okay, does it make sense or not? These kind of additional information, looking at histograms of properties, et cetera, is what gives them confidence, I think, that, okay, these models are, although somewhat black box, but it seems to make sense, right? And of course, then you always have the blind tests and all. I mean, a lot of the time, people are not giving us all the data. They will give us the data until maybe the last two years of data is not given to us. And then they want to see how the models behave on the two years. So we are absolutely blind to that data. And if you're able to do well in that, that gives them a lot of confidence. And I, I'm, I think the same kind of approaches should also be used with traditional simulation because frankly, in, when I was there in Chevron I mean, and, and even many companies, simulation was used like, oh, you use all the data to history match. You have a good model. I mean, you have fit everything, but of course you have multipliers and whatnot to fit the models. How do you know that's a good model? Even if it has full first principles physics, physics but still it may be a pretty bad model because you have used, you do not have any geological constraints on those models. You're just applying ad hoc multipliers to sort of fit those models, right? So, I mean, it's the same kind of problem, I think, here as well, right? So. Great, thank you very much. Dr. Foster, did, did you have another question? Yeah, I had a second question, but uh, I'll, I'll also just say, I couldn't agree with your last statement more. I mean, uh, a lot, you know, when you history match these, it's just an overfit 
uh, exactly. if you're not doing if you're not doing any type of uh, uh, cross valid proper cross validation. So I think yeah. the the kind of forward physics modeling community can learn a lot from the machine learning community on cross validation techniques. But yeah, uh, my question is uh, with respect to those figure you have up the slide before I think where you had the ensemble of models. How are you generating those ensemble? Is it, are you just bootstrapping the data and using the same sort of architecture and, and running the forward predictions, or do you literally have different models, meaning different architectures of the neural network, or maybe you're using you know one neural network, one support vector machine? How are those ensembles generated? Yeah, that's a, that's a good. No, these are all neural networks in this case, but the ensemble is essentially an ensemble of properties. So if you remember, there are physical properties embedded because of the physical equations. We have physical properties embedded into this, right? So these are an ensemble of properties like the range of permeabilities, the range of porosities, and all these, and obviously all the all the data driven parameters as well. So yeah, it's basically a combination of all the training parameters that you're learning, and that is a combination of both physical properties and obviously weights of the neural networks that you're learning. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Foster. Any other questions from the group? All right, Dr. Sharma, thank you so much. You, um, you've definitely generated a lot of interest and a lot of discussion. It was great to have you visit us. Um, next time, let's find an opportunity to be able to bring you to Austin and show you some Texas hospitality. But thank you very much for joining by Zoom today. We appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Michael. And thanks, everyone, for your time. Bye.